and i really and i really hope to hear from some more of you to present in the next few weeks do so, we have anybody else yet sophia we, we do have a couple of others but we have a room we have room for others to speak so uh, definitely if you're interested if you have a movie definitely do that so it's time let me start um where is um lois right here okay lois we're about to start salam peace and shalom so welcome back to movies in the spirit and i want to start by saying that movies has had a serious and big impact in my life with their complex combination of plot and characters light sound music they draw us into this illusion of reality which is sometimes more immediate than any other form of communication and then movies have this ability to generate a very immediate physical intellectual and emotional response and perhaps that's why i was reading in a survey that more people in our culture in united states watch movies on any given weekend than attend a worship service in a church temple or a mosque and such a change in practice in the last few decades has led scholars to rethink that how films might be functioning religiously i i just recently got a book by john uh, lydon or john lydon which is titled film as religion and he argues that even though film doesn't replace religion but it definitely functions itself at times at religion and his argument is not simplistic because he builds on very sophistical studies of what is the purpose of religion and what is the role movies is taking on in our modern culture and i will be sharing more from that book but for now welcome to our 2022 session of interfaith explorations with jay and sophia a program of the interfaith center also co-sponsored by spirituality and practice the website that we always use and co-sponsored by process and faith in this class every session we have two presenters and today's esteemed presenters are sheila peters and dr jay mcdaniel and we are going to start with Sheila who will uh, share a small preview or trailer of the movie that she's presenting followed by Sheila's reflection and a question that she'll pose to you all and Jay will facilitate that discussion so having said that Sheila let's just go to you and the movie that you're bringing to us today welcome to our class sorry i'm muted Thank you so much. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about something that films, I'm like you, Sophia, they, they really have been instrumental in, in shaping my spiritual path, as well as other things in my life. But um, I, I love movies and I particularly loved this movie, which is called Arrival. And um, I didn't prepare to share my screen for the trailer. I will Is share, being... I will share, Sheila. Okay. okay, thank you, <laughs> thank you. So if you wanna go ahead and show that, we can just start with that and then I'll talk. There are days that define your story beyond your life. <laughs> like the day they arrived. Signs of what might be called first contact. The objects measure at least... I'm Colonel G.T. Webb from Army Intelligence. Pack your bags. You're at the top of everyone's list when it comes to translations. Priority one. What do they want? Where are they from? You'll be reporting to me, but you'll be working with him when you're in the show. That's what they call him, the UFO. being carted off in the medevac. Not everyone is wired for what you're about to do. So what do they look like? You'll see soon enough. Every 18 hours, a door opens up. That's where we go in. It's time. Yeah, 
now that has happened. What happens now? They arrive. They need to see me. Dr. Bank? Are you insane? Now that's a proper introduction. More objects have landed around the world. This is one of 12. I'm never going to be able to speak their words. You got two days. Figure something out. I am pure metal. It's their language. We need to make sure that they understand the difference between a weapon and a tool. Language is messy, and sometimes one can be both. Are you dreaming in their language? It's possible they're prodding us to fight among ourselves. This is just a way to force us to work together for once. It's more complicated than that. How is it more complicated? Russia just executed one of their own to keep their secret. We've got 21 hours before they start global war. How do we clarify their intentions? I go back in. Why does this feel worse? Okay, thank you. I'm going to um, change my view to gallery. Will that affect anything on? Okay, because I just want to, I want to see a show of hands of how many people have actually seen this movie. Not many. Okay, okay. So, well, some. Um, well, it was very difficult. I've seen it like half a dozen times. I love it that much. And so it was very difficult for me to sort of, um, did we have a question? I think Carol has her hand raised. No, you're okay. Oh, okay. We'll wait for you to finish your reflection and then they can. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, I, I had a hard time just going sort of by the um, trailer and, and the um, review to talk about this movie because it's so, it, there's so much in it that um, it's, it's hard for me to condense that, but I'm, I'm gonna give it a good shot. Um, and mainly I'm gonna focus on what uh, came out of the trailer because I think there were two really good clues in there about what I think the movie's really about, which <laughs> is not the whole alien arrival and is the earth going to come to an end and you know how are we going to deal with the fear and the insecurity of having these aliens here um and so in the trailer there's not much of a clue um as to what i think the movie and also i think the review on uh spirituality and practice sort of saw as the real theme of the movie and they talk about that in the last paragraph, I'm gonna read the two things that they got out of this movie. One, um, the spiritual thrust of this sobering drama is in its thematic embrace of dialogue as a habit of the heart that involves reverence, compassion, openness, and deep listening. Amy Adams in a solid and nuanced performance <laughs> models these virtues in her encounters with the two aliens. The other theme given a workout in Arrival is the importance of time as a portal of change and refreshment. I love both these themes, and I'm, but I'm really gonna focus today on the first one, which is I love that phrase, habit of the heart, that dialogue is a habit of the heart. And in this movie, I think uh, the character of Louise really embraces that whole theme. Um, it's really about communication, real communication, which I think <clears throat> only comes um, with certainly deep listening, um, openness to a, 
to the other, um, but also comes, one thing they didn't mention is that real communication, I don't think can happen without there being a sense of desire or at least intention of trying to understand where the other person is coming from. In other words, understand their experience in order to really be able to listen to what they're saying, want to even hear what they're saying, and then also to be able to actually conduct a dialogue. So that's essentially what this woman who is a linguist, a linguist, she is trained and experienced, she's a college professor, but she is recruited, has been recruited in the past by the military to translate for them in different languages. And here these aliens have landed and not only do we not can't understand what they're saying, but we know nothing about where they're from, who they are, what their intention is. So the military is trying to get her to uh, speak to them and find out what their intention is. So that's the beginning to me of communication is, you know, do we both intend a dialogue? So the trailer, um, the, the parts that I love about the trailer that sort of give you clues to, to how uh, Louise approaches this is that first scene where there's all this sci-fi fear stuff going on with the music. The visuals are great in this movie. It's visually beautiful, the movie is. Um, but the her first instinct as a communicator is she's in all this garb all that you saw her in all this spacesuit thing and she takes off and in spite of the fear in spite of what the military has told her are the rules of engagement with these creatures she under her own intention of trying to be her authentic self says they need to see me and I think that's such a open such a, a an idea of openness there she's essentially she doesn't know she could be risking her life doing this but it works because the aliens come back with their she puts her hand on the screen and the aliens come back with an appendage on the screen. And she sort of breathes a sigh of relief at that point and says, now that's a proper introduction. So she uses body language. She doesn't use spoken language at that point. She's totally um, <clears throat> using gestures, using body language trying to convey a welcome, um, a, a desire to engage with the other, non-threatening, trying to build some trust before she even starts to try to understand their language. Um, so I think, first of all, this movie is great about showing the, the um, limits that we have with our languages. And that is certainly a, a thing I think that's so wonderful <clears throat> with, with our interfaith exploration is the whole idea that, you know, if you're of different beliefs, you're often speaking a different language. You may be using English, but are the words coming from the same experience in you? Are the, are the, even the gestures can be threatening to another culture, whereas for us, they're welcoming. So all of that is, is in this example that this movie gives of someone truly trying to communicate and if they are not able to communicate, it may mean like just world war will break out. So in the end, well, let me say the other clue in the trailer 
uh, that I wanted to point out is when Louise is talking to the Colonel and uh, her fellow scientists and says, um, we need to make sure they understand, the aliens understand the difference in our words for weapon and tool because language is messy and sometimes one word can mean both things. So we get, again, a real indication of how important and how inadequate often our words are not, and so not only is it gonna be difficult to communicate with each other because this character not only has to learn to communicate with aliens, but she's having to learn to communicate with other human beings that have a totally <laughs> different view of these aliens <clears throat> and the threat that the world is facing or non-threat in this, but so, She's, she's wanting to step, to pull back the military <laughs> from acting impatiently while she goes through this painstaking process of learning language. And she chooses, ends up choosing instead of the spoken language to uh, start with the written language. And then that's where the element of time comes into this and, um, because the alien language is not linear in the same way that our language is. It's, it, there are these circular icono iconography sort of things. And so um, she finds out, and I don't want to give away for the whole mystery of it, but she does find out that, that, um, that they, she learns their language and learning their language because it is so different from uh, our language. Um, she begins to think in their language and that has implications to her own sense of time and how time controls our view of our life even. So, but I wanted to mention too, and then I'll, I'll let y'all talk. Um, there is a, the very first scene in the movie is this vignette of uh, Amy Adams' character, Louise, uh, with her daughter growing up um, from infancy, you know, from her daughter's birth until uh, the end of her life, which happens very early from a, a childhood disease. And um, that sense that you get from the love that they share and the relationship that she has with her daughter um, is just beautiful. And it's beautifully depicted and it's very brief but it really is the heart of then what she experiences um, with the aliens. Um, one thing that I wrote that I kind of wanted to share. Um, oh, you wanted the question. The question uh, that <laughs> maybe we can talk about is um, how might our world be different if we truly engaged in the kind of communication that's depicted between these aliens and this human and um, how, might, how might it change things? And also how might, um, if we were presented with a, whole different view of time, not being linear, but being in a, in a more circular pattern where there is no past or future, there is only the present, basically. Um, how would that affect the choices we make? Thanks. Thanks, Sheila. 
Well, let's let's take Sheila up on those questions. And Sheila, I, 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 I was, I'm also interested in the question of extraterrestrials myself. <laughs> and, and, and I know that that's not the focus, but I just want to say that is also really worthy of a discussion. Yes. Sometime, sometime. But let's go for the question of, of the need for dialogue in the world today and the role that our own intentions play in that and the need to understand actually the intentions of others. And sometimes the fact that our languages can inhibit our capacities to understand the intentions of others. So in a way we have to learn other people's languages, verbal to be sure, but emotional, cultural, <clears throat> religious, all kinds of things. Uh, has anybody, does anybody grapple with this question of what makes for dialogue and how to enter into it? Nita? Unmute. Well, uh, I, I really liked uh, the statement that, that Sheila brought out that's where she says, they need to see me. And so there is this sense when we enter a real dialogue with someone that we're willing to be vulnerable and we're willing to be open and authentic. And uh, that's risky sometimes. And uh, to suspend um, all of our, uh, even culture or parameters that we tend to put around ourselves for protection at times, just this sense of she just couldn't wait to pull off that garb and say, you've got to see me. And I think all of us are asking for that. And people, especially that we have a hard time dialoguing with uh, because we don't necessarily know what their intentions are or agree with them. Uh, how do we get to the point where we're real and vulnerable to be open? I think that's a great um, part of the movie. Anybody else have thoughts on that? Uh, Jay, this, Jay, this Jerry, I, I do yeah, think Jerry, it, go ahead. I think it lines up a little bit like international travel. I mean, uh, this is international travel taken to galactic levels, maybe. But and I also think I would not have seen this movie because I don't do well with scary movies. And this trailer scared me a little bit. But I do think if you get into traveling internationally, I think Mark Twain's comment about I forgot some of the best education is travel or whatever. That's really not fair to Mark Train, but something like that. But I had the sense of the uncomfortability about going to a place where you don't know jokes, you don't know the culture, you don't know why they're doing what they're doing, but and it's a vulnerability. But I felt like we were being taught about you know, the kind of the egocentric, you know, we're fine if somebody speaks English or if a translator speaks Irish, but <clears throat> we project a level of either lack of sophistication or lack of comfort in anyone who's not like us in a way that's really harmful. Um, so I, I, I enjoyed the trail. I didn't see the movie and I probably wouldn't select it based upon fear. But I'm glad to see it. Though. Well, thank you. The, the scariest wanna... part, Jerry, to me in the movie, in the actual movie, the scariest parts are what the humans do, not what the aliens do. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it's not really terribly scary. It's suspenseful, but not, not scary, scary. <laughs> Anybody else want to jump in there? didn't help i watched it last night i've never i don't watch these kinds of movies either usually but i decided the trailer was intriguing and so i did and i could not help but think about i watched it right after i watched the news and the news is very frightening to me right now with uh in ukraine and and uh in china and all of that and how they're going generally to the military um, perspective without actually trying to engage in what well, we hear about negotiations behind the scene, but th that they're not actually being 
successful. And I think there was just a go to, well, okay, let's start sending those arms without actually perhaps taking a step back to say, how do we communicate? Maybe, you know, Putin is seeing it one way and, and, and the other diplomats are seeing it another way. Anyway, I know that's not exactly what, what we wanted to go to here, but I, I just couldn't help it. And the other thought I had was in terms of, I speak English and so do my children, but we don't always speak the same language. And I think that there's, um, when we're talking about um, aliens, I don't see my kids as aliens, but, but they see me as an alien sometimes. And the idea that I need to get into the same cultural place where they are sometimes to have conversations with my own kids. So having it very close to home. Um, I, I also was thinking about that as I watched the movie, how I have a perception that they understand where I'm coming from when I give a suggestion or when I make a comment. And that's actually not always the case. There, I need to do more investigation into, into what their culture is before perhaps engaging them sometimes in that, in that conversation. So anyway, that's my two cents. No, that's great. Anybody else want to jump in? Well, have a thought. yeah, Priscilla. Well, I was just going to say, I, I think what Ellen says um, is so true in that a lot of the problem with communication is that we want to communicate what we feel, what we think, and we think the other person can understand where we're coming from. And instead of trying to communicate what we feel, we need to, to be more proactive in trying to understand where the person we're trying to communicate with is coming from. And um, it's just, Everyone wants to be understood. They want to explain themselves and they, but we need to stop explaining ourselves. I think sometimes and listen to the other one. That's all. That's a lot. That's a lot. Anybody else want to jump in, make a comment, add to the discussion? Go ahead, Darlene. Uh, I just thought it was so interesting, the feeling that I had as I first started watching the movie. I still have 24 minutes left to finish that movie. I <laughs> tried to rush it in, but um, I just had this feeling of that the scenes in the beginning of that movie, as she is approaching this group and how how afraid Amy was shaking in her in her suited whatever you call that um, she was working through her fear and she was facing this unknown and as she worked through this place she allowed more and more of her fear, I think, to just subside. And she was able to really reach a place of hearing her own heart as she worked with these aliens. I, I don't know. I just thought that was an interesting way to look at fear, that sometimes we are just so afraid of something. And if we could just allow the possibility of sitting there with it, sometimes that fear just dissipates. Um, I agree um, with you, Tarlene. I saw the movie on the weekend, and uh, Sheila, I love the movie. I love movies anyways, but I love this movie. It's beautiful, very spiritual. I loved it for its visuals and its music. The music is just hauntingly beautiful music. But I want to say a few things. Number one, like Darlene said, it, the movie does a beautiful job of 
showing us that how fear divides humanity mm-hmm. and how it leads human beings towards destruction and wars unless there's a very strong intentional effort to do dialogue but um, a couple of things which came to me from movie is that i i am very heavily involved um with the resettlement of a dozen afghan families nowadays and uh, they don't speak my language i don't speak their language they are being taken care of uh, by several congregations and the care teams who are taking care of these families they do not speak the language at all so i was watching the movie and i'm constantly thinking about all those episodes of me sitting with the family not knowing a thing that they wanna tell me and not being able to communicate a single word to them and how frustrating it has been and i wanna bring it out that you know we humans and it's based on my last 4 or 5 years um, months of experience of working with these people with whom i have no tools to communicate that when we are with people who are so different from us and you don't speak the same language we desperately want to help them understand who we are relying on the tools the limited tools of communication that we have which is language and and it doesn't work and what we forget is to bring in our our presence our energy our spirit our authentic self and i think one thing that has helped me and many others in this afghan project in which communication was the biggest challenge is just just being there mm-hmm. with our loving kind compassionate energy even though we don't understand a word that the next person is trying to say and we don't know how to talk to them but our energy and our authentic self just opens up hearts in ways that we understand each other um start understanding each other without words so that's one thing i experienced in my last work and this this movie highlighted that and the other thing which actually strongly struck me in this movie is the concept of time so as a muslim and as a um believing in muslim theology i believe time is a is a creation and there was a there was a time before time and there will be a time after time and time can be folded and wrapped and unfolded so i loved the way movie beautifully showed us that time doesn't have to be linear mm-hmm. and uh, time there there doesn't need to be a past or a future all the time we can live in the moments of time from past and from the future so that's one concept from the movie which i which i really cherish so thank you for sharing this with us sharing the movie with us so you want to add a, a a last word before we turn to the next one rasat i just appreciate everything that everybody said and you said it so much better than i did so <laughs> <laughs> but yes i i think and this movie is so much more to me than what most science fiction movies seem to deliver in the sense of it even got reviewed badly by people who are real fans of action science fiction because that's not really you know what the movie is it's very there are parts of it in fact my husband finally said this thing's just too slow because her process is so slow and um painstaking you know the the detail of her process it's just wonderful to watch and i have become a huge fan of amy adams she's a great actress <laughs> so anyway i hope you enjoy it if you watch it i certainly will watch it again <laughs> Well, thank you, Sheila. And we'll, we'll turn to the next film now. And it's a film called Babette's Feast. Uh, have any of you seen Babette's Feast? Uh, I went to seminary myself. I was in pre- preparing to be a Christian minister. I've seen it three times. And, and all the seminarians said, have you seen Babette's Feast? 
And I, I thought, well, no, but why is it so important? Why is it so important? And I'm actually still wrestling with that question. So that's that's a question that that I'll present to you. Let's let's begin with um, some clips. I couldn't find a trailer that told told us quite enough. So I, I chose a review, a short review from the New York Times uh, to use. Lewis, can you find that review and put it up for us? Vi fick Kai on Sarkofar, en rätt som hon själv komponerat. General Galifé, som var värd för kvällen, förklarade att denna kvinna, denna kökschef, var kapabel att förvandla en måltid till en slags uh, kärleksaffär. Ett uh, älskogsförhåll där man inte längre kunde skilja mellan fysisk och anelig aptit. There are a lot of movies in which food figures, a lot of movies with banquets and feasts and parties. There are very few movies I can think of where food, the preparation and the eating of food, the sharing of a meal, plays such a central role as it does in Gabriel Axel's Babette's Feast. Based on a story by the Danish novelist Isaac Dinesen, Babette's Feast is set in the 19th century in a remote part of Denmark. It concerns two sisters, Martina and Philippa. They're the daughters of a Protestant minister who's sort of the dominant figure in this rural, very pious community. When they're young, they each have a suitor. One of them has a young, dashing officer. The other, a rather florid French opera singer, who also gives her voice lessons. But neither relationship works out, and the two women grow toward middle age together as spinsters. Then one day, a mysterious French woman, played by the great actress Stéphane Audran, shows up on their doorstep. She's an old friend of the opera singer, and she's fleeing from political persecution in Paris. She becomes the sister's cook and housekeeper, and she masters the local diet, which consists basically of boiled salted fish and a porridge made from stale bread and old beer. Brød. Brød. Lægges i blød. They live like this for 14 years, and then one day, Babette wins the lottery. And she decides that before going back home to France, she's going to treat the sisters to a lavish and extravagant French feast. And the preparation and the sharing of this meal takes up almost the entire second half of this movie, and it's lingered over in wonderful detail. about this movie and why it is so moving and so satisfying and so fulfilling is that it shows that this religious asceticism and this sensuality are really expressions of the same impulse, which is an impulse of love and generosity and spiritual fulfillment. Locken schlaf, schieren kommt, in die Hüden los vorerst so, wer los der Kugel fängt vor. And I think there's one more scene I'd like to show you. There's, there's beautiful scenes of the food and the relationships between the people. But at the, at the feast, at Babette's feast, the, um, the cavalry officer um, is asked to give a little toast in the middle of it. And I'd like for us to see his toast and to listen to the words of his toast. Um, Lewis, can you share that? Varmhärtighet och sannhet mötas. Rättvisa och fröjd ska kyssa varandra. 
Människan tror i sin svaghet och sin kortsynthet att hon måste göra sitt val här i livet. Och fruktar den risk hon där vi löper. Vi känner frukten. Men nej, vårt val är utan betydelse. Den tid kommer då våra ögon öppnas och vi omsider inser att nåden är utan ände. Vi ska bland vänta i tillit och mottaga i tacksamhet. Nåden ställer inga villkor. Och se allt som vi har valt blev oss givet. Allt där vi har avstått från blir oss beviljat. Ja, vi får också det tillbaka som vi har kastat bort. Varmhärdighet och sannhet mötas. Rättvisa och fröjd ska kyssa varann. The two sisters, uh, Martina and Felipe, had both been really quite beautiful when they were young. And their father was uh, a, a Protestant minister and brought them up in a very austere religious sect, wh which they believed in, and they loved him. And so they were both um, courted, and they both rejected that and they chose a life of renunciation and became part of this austere religious community. But remember in their minds what could have been, but was not, but were deeply committed to, to the truth of their religious sect as they understood it. And then Babette comes and Babette, um, It's so interesting, she was a political revolutionary as well as a chef. She had to escape persecution. She comes from Paris and she lives with them for 14 years and then wins the lottery and says, the last thing I'd like to do for you before I leave is uh, have a feast for you, a real French meal. And the people in the community, they didn't know what to do with that at first. A real French meal, that's a little scary. Will there be wine? Turtles? <laughs> All this rich food? Is it okay? And as you can see, uh, they really enjoyed that meal. And the meal brought them together. Uh, in a beautiful way. It's not that they weren't together before that, but they were together in a still more excellent way. So as you read reviews of this, you might think, oh, everybody's going to say Babette saves them and they didn't have anything in that austerity prior to being saved by Babette. But that's not what the reviews typically say. There was beauty in both. There was beauty in the asceticism, and does, do all, we all know the word asceticism, A-S-C-E. There was beauty in the asceticism, and there was beauty in celebrating, entering into the pleasures of the flesh. So it raises the question for us. Um, I, I can think of four questions and just take any of them. One is uh, in your own religious upbringing or in, in that with which you were familiar, 
was there something in it that was ascetic, A-S-C-E-T-I-C, -E uh, best to renounce the pleasures of the flesh in order to be attuned to the truth of the spirit. It may have taken the form of attitudes towards sexuality or music or food, who knows? But was there something in the asceticism of your upbringing? And was there something good about it? Was there something good about it? Second question is, oh, what is the wisdom of indulgence? That is indulging the senses, indulging the life of the flesh, accepting that, embracing that. Is there something beautiful there too? So sometimes is the spirit found in the flesh, not apart from the flesh, in the flesh. Third question, how about food? What role does food play in enlivening community in the life of the spirit? And last question. If you read the Brussett's review of this, I always look for what letter of the spiritual alphabet will they choose to name what this was about? What will they choose? And um, you know what they chose? G for grace. G for grace. And that was really, I think, the point of that general sermon. There's something in our universe that accepts the whole, embraces the whole, without discrimination, both the way of the senses and the way of renouncing the senses. It accepts them all. It says, come forward. So I don't know if, did I raise any questions that you'd like to think about or reflect upon? there and would anybody like to add something to what I just said or subtract? Louis, is your, is your hand up? Yeah, so that actually, um, that did bring, oh, let me spotlight myself now. Sorry, I'm trying to facilitate and and speak at the same time. Um, it actually, what was really interesting about it is um, I love the contrast of the asceticism and the indulgence kind of like of the flesh. Um, it, it brought me back actually to college. Um, when I was in college, I had a, a standing, like a standing meeting every week with the, the rabbi at Hello. And I remember I was in college, I was like working full time and I still had like my full time classes. And I expressed to him one time, like, I'm dying, like, I'm killing myself with all of these classes and all of my work. And like, it, it was kind of like that ascetic, like, I, you know, deprivation from like anything really fun. And he said to me, he said, have you considered like, you know, actually taking the Sabbath seriously? Because I think you need that. And um, I ended up actually not, you, you know, um, on from you know Friday night onwards all through Saturday what I ended up doing is I had I put I didn't do any homework I like stopped scheduling myself for work and I ended up um like doing a bunch of like self-care stuff and it was only kind of when it was brought up to me in this semi like spiritual you know way of saying hey take care of yourself like celebrate celebrate your body and celebrate your free time as well mm -hmm. um that I ended up having a more balanced life so I I really enjoyed, um, I really enjoyed the movie. I really enjoyed the trailer. And I love how we can see this in religions all across the world. Um, you know, uh, Orthodox Christianity, um, you know, Islam, um, you know, everywhere you can see it, not just in, in Judaism. So I lower my hand. You know, th thank you, Lewis. And I hadn't thought of, of the Sabbath, of Shabbat, 
as a context in which spirit and flesh might come together. Um, but it, but food plays a, a prominent role in the Sabbath, in Shabbat. So it's just interesting for me. Anybody else, um, a comment, a thought? Has anybody experienced um, a conflict between spirituality on the one hand and embracing the life of the senses on the other? Or, or is that kind of old fashioned and part of my generation, but, but not a newer generation? Go ahead, Sally. I see your hand raised up. If you can highlight her, Louis. Yeah, I am. Um, I can't speak so much to that conflict. I guess, no, I haven't experienced it. But my comment is about how differently the people related, the community related to one another enjoy yeah. and, and the surprise and delight on their faces at the exquisite tastes. And they related to each other in a whole new way than than by their um, privation that indulgence was um a really up in a whole new way for them to communicate and so that's my comment food is magic mm. anybody else a thought uh, yes priscilla and then nita uh, well i <laughs> I think wine also played a significant role in their mellowing. Um, wine and food and the, the conflict, I think, comes not in enjoying uh, a life of the senses, but if that's the only life you choose, I think balance is the important thing in life. Like Lewis was saying, he, he had to balance and give himself some time um, to get, to feel good about what he was doing in life. And mm -hmm. I don't know, I think that the, the group in the movie had, had gone too far the other way. And they were beginning to bicker a lot once mm -hmm. the father was gone. And they were, they didn't have the strong leader to pull them back. But the feast gave them the opportunity to feel good about themselves and their neighbors again. Balance. Thank you. Thank you. Nita. Well, uh, I'm captured by the phrase um, righteousness, and, righteousness and bliss shall kiss. I really like that phrase that we talked about from the trailer. And um, I think about my one of my grandmothers who was pretty conservative and uh, I would say fundamentalist, which I'm not. Um, but there was a certain amount of my upbringing that gave me a rudder uh, of some core uh, choices to live a fairly moral life, they were important to me. But I, as I grew up, um, I had my grandmother's Bible that she would underline things and make notes and so forth. And she had actually written when Jesus had the first mi miracle uh, at the wed wedding of Canaan changing the water into wine, where she wrote in the margin, not really wine, just grape juice. <laughs> And I went, I thought about that and I thought, you know, that is not righteousness kissing bliss, her view of life, uh, because I think we can have both and need desperately. I think that righteousness kissing bliss may be a psalm, may come from a psalm, not sure. Carol, what you, what you want to say? I want to say that I, I dread Danish movies because they paint these extremes all the time, you know, the kind of the extreme landscape and the extreme 
deprivation of color and you know all of the extremes in order to get us to transcend the either or and i think the movie is about transcendence as the previous movie was about transcendence it's not in the form of time or language it's not in the abstinence or indulgence it's about transcendence and i think both films take us to that uh, realization that is the intentionality uh, placing ourselves um, in a receptive mode that uh, allows for transcendence. So, um, you know, the two beautiful young women who were abstaining still had a kind of bliss because they were the objects of adoration in that community, you know. So it wasn't that they were flawless and perfect in their. Um, denial of the body they became adored as an object perhaps or as an icon uh you know so there is always that 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 tension of what is abstinence what is indulgence and and what is grace and gift yeah, uh, yeah. and how do we place ourselves in a receptive mode to that susan did you have a comment too Unmute. There we go. My, Jay, your question about our own traditions and what, in thinking back to how we were raised, and I was, uh, I've been a Presbyterian all my life, and I remember having a friend's child come visit our church one time. And she was Episcopalian and you, she looked around kind of like, is this all there is? And I realized that a lot of our service and all that did not seem to allow quite as much or didn't promote the idea of mystery, the mystery of the divine. And I think part of that maybe goes back to the Reformation and, and swinging that pendulum back pretty far but i thought that the the meal really did just capture that whole idea of mystery and the it that was the chord it struck in me mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thank you it was out chemical so. you know yeah steve you did you find the biblical quotation did you find it Not sure he did, but he said Psalm 80, 85, 10. Sophia, did you have something you wanted to say? Um, in a minute, Jay, we have a comment from Sheila. I think uh, okay, Sheila sorry. raised her hand and yeah. we missed Thanks. her. I, I was just struck by the um, juxtaposition of these films, but it, it made me smile when I saw that um, Jay was doing a foreign language film because the whole idea in arrival of, you know, learning someone else's language, it's always been difficult for me personally to watch uh, foreign language films because I'm so, you know, geared to um, my language and the subtitles always sort of pull me in where I can't even watch the movie. I mean, the visuals become secondary. And so that's always just an issue for me. I just wanted to throw that out there. I know that doesn't speak to your questions, Jay, but I, I thought it was a nice um, balance that we had today with it's it is sort of all about community and communication. In the long run, both of these movies address communication. So. Sophia, thank yes. you, Sheila. Thank you, Sheila. If there are no other comments, and Jay, I don't know if you want to touch on the Psalm 8510. I was actually going to close the class because we're almost at the time. Yeah, go ahead. It's OK. Well, I just quickly want to say thank you to Jay and uh, Sheila for bringing us these two beautiful movies to help us explore the relevance of film for our own spirituality. Because for many of us, um, like me, 
um, films are a very important part of our living experience. They, they help us make sense of our own lives. They help us find our own place in this world. They sometimes help us encounter God and our own spirituality in one way or another. They help us find our own humanity within us and humanity in others. So films have a lot of transforming power on uh, many of us and um, I do believe in that. And if you are one of those people or if there has been a place in your heart or soul which has been touched by a movie, then please email us and let us know so we can bring that movie and your presentation to this group. With that said, sending love and light your way. Salam, peace and shalom. I will see you all next Wednesday.